Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Marie-Elise, and thank you all for the invitation to come and speak to you at this really quite amazing event. It's uh, quite an experience to see so many faces looking back at me. Um, the title of this conference is uh, Language in a Thousand Forms. And the form that you're going to have for the next 30 minutes is a very particular form of English from the Midlands in the UK. So I hope you can cope with that form of English. And I'm very grateful for the interpreters and the technicians who are helping me communicate effectively to you in this way. Um, a couple of little points about the title of my presentation. Firstly, I know I shouldn't start a presentation asking for some form of forgiveness, but it does seem a little bit ironic that you've got a Brit presenting something about Europe at the moment. So we're not going to have any more discussions about Brexit and I'm not going to raise it in my presentation. Um, secondly, a glance from Europe is actually quite a tall order. There's, a, there's such a lot I could be telling you about this topic and about what's happening in some of the other European countries. I could have probably filled the two days. So uh, the timekeeper's going to have to keep me on, on track for this. Uh, this will be a very particular input on the topic that you're thinking about from a very particular perspective, if that's okay. And what I'd like to do is to briefly introduce the work of the European Agency to you, just to give you a bit of context as to the issues I'm trying to get across. Then I'd like to talk just briefly about the idea that changing thinking and language around special educational needs is something which is a really important process that we're all involved in. Then I'd like to touch upon the idea of shared ideas, shared concepts and shared understandings and how important that is for our work together in special needs and inclusive education. And then finally, I'd like to give you an example of some work from the agency where we're using very particular shared understandings and shared language around the topic of inclusive education to collect data which is comparable across different European countries. So, the, the factual stuff to start off with. The European Agency. Bit of a long title for the name of an organisation, European Agency for Special Needs and Inclusive Education. We actually cut it back by at least three words, so we're gradually shortening it. But we are quite a big organisation. 30 member countries and we're an organisation of the ministries of education in those member countries. We're funded by them to conduct different areas of work on their behalf and we have a, an office in Denmark and an office in Brussels and then staff are um, dotted around Europe and work in their home countries. Um, Norway was actually a founding member of the agency back in 1996 when we started. Our work is to work with policymakers, for policymakers, to try and develop evidence based information and recommendations uh, relating to special needs education and inclusive education. Um, the idea that we are able to involve different stakeholder groups is very important for us. We involve practitioners such as yourselves as well as policy makers and researchers in our work. And what we aim to do is provide a collective voice. We try to identify topics and issues that all countries seem to be facing in terms of challenges, but also all countries see as opportunities for developing their systems, and then share them with the other countries, as well as share them with uh, organisations such as the European Commission. So, changing thinking and language around special needs and inclusive education. Um, on the slide I'm showing at the moment, I've actually got the word 
changing in italics. And that's quite deliberate because I wanted to emphasize that even this word has got two meanings. And in this context, I want it to have two meanings. Changing thinking about special needs and inclusive education is an ongoing process. The thinking is changing all the time. But we also need to change thinking. We need to push that change. And there is a, a need for policymakers and practitioners to think about how they are actively changing their thinking about the words that are used and about the concepts behind the words. Are we talking the same language when we're doing our work in the European arena? Um, the European Agency works with 25 official languages, plus quite a few unofficial languages, like Welsh and Luxembourgish and Catalan and Galician. There were lots of different versions of uh, languages out there. Um, one of the biggest issues we face in our work is difficulties in transplanting terms and concepts from one language system to another. And I use the word transplanting there rather than translating, because words can be translated from one set of research or one uh, arena of practice, and we all think that we have got the right translation. Um, but sometimes that's not correct. And transplanting an idea, taking an idea from one concept to another situation, Sometimes we think we've got it right, but maybe that's not always the case. What we find in our work is that there are a lot of difficulties in agreeing cross-national operational terms. Um, terms that everybody agrees on and has agreed a way of explaining and thinking about that term. But what we also find that in many countries work in the field of inclusive education and special needs education, there are actually difficulties in agreeing within a nation or within a regional municipality operational terms. We might use words like inclusive education and we think everybody's thinking about the same thing and everybody's thinking inclusive education means the same thing for me as it means for you. But very often our work is showing that's not the case. And unless there are shared understandings, there can be difficulties in implementation. Troublesome terms. Um, there are a number of words which we can think of as showing this change process that has happened over recent years in our field. Special needs education, special educational needs. Maybe the thinking there was about how can we be working with individual learners who've got particular needs and how do we support those needs. Special needs education and inclusion started to take us towards thinking about, well, the wider context of the school and the processes that are happening within the education system. Inclusive education, thinking about equal opportunities, thinking about equity issues, takes the thinking further, even further. It takes the thinking towards inclusive education as an approach for all learners and not just some with a particular additional or special educational needs. So these terms show maybe a change in thinking and a movement in thinking. But sometimes the use of these terms has been changed in policies, in practice and in research but the thinking behind the terms hasn't changed. And what we're finding in quite a few areas of our work, that in many policy and practice situations, people are talking about inclusive education. People are talking about equity. People are talking about inclusive education as an approach for all learners. But maybe what they're really thinking about is special educational needs and 
having an approach which is still about a few learners and supporting a few learners with particular dis difficulties. I think I'd like to start uh, digging into why some of these terms are, are troublesome. Special educational needs is a word which we all use and we use it in our own languages and you use it in English and probably other languages as well as Norwegian. Um, but it is actually a construction. There's no agreed definition of what a special educational need is. And if we look across countries' policies and we look across different countries' legislation, what we find is that special educational needs is a term <coughs> excuse me, that they have defined and that's grown up and developed within their context. And it's used to identify and assess and make provision for learners in different ways. But how it's used in one country and how it's used in another is completely different. So a little example. Some countries are trying to move away from using the term special educational needs. Think about additional needs. Other countries still have different categories of special educational needs within their legislation. Some of them just a few, four or five, some of them up to 14, 12 or 14 different categories. When it comes down to practice, maybe we're working with the same groups of learners. But when we're thinking about policy and how the thinking that might be going behind policies when we use these terms is driving our work, maybe there are different things happening and maybe the use of terms like special educational needs within very particular contexts, it, it, we need to be a little bit careful about comparing them across different uh, national or international contexts. Inclusive education is another term that at the European level we can pretty much say there's no real understanding, shared understanding or agreement on what we're talking about here. Um, we can see that this term has gone through a change in thinking. Inclusive education is placement of learners with disabilities. Moving on to thinking about meeting the social and academic needs of learners with disabilities. Then a movement to thinking about inclusive education uh, for all learners, that it's an approach for all learners in uh, mainstream education. Now we can see lots of debates at policy and particularly research level about inclusive education as a, an approach for developing learning communities and learning communities which have the aim of high quality education for all learners. But again, there's no shared understandings about this term. And what we find in our work is that there's no clear policy operational definitions which are then being used to guide practice. There's no clear pictures very often in countries of the expectations of what inclusive education looks like in practice. So the importance of shared understandings then. Lots of confusions around lots of terms. Why is it so important that we, we have shared understandings that we can use and we can work in a collaborative way together as uh, using them as a basis for our work? One example I would like to give from a European perspective on a change uh, in thinking which we would say is probably quite a strong example of a shared understanding at the moment, is the change in thinking from why to how regarding inclusive education. I would say that maybe over the last five, ten years, there were many policymakers at European level, uh, internationally, as well as at different national levels, that were saying, well, why should we have inclusive education? Those sorts of questions are moving away now, and the thinking is moving towards how. 
How do we do inclusive education in the best way? How do we move from individual support, which is maybe a compensatory approach for some learners, it's, it's giving support for something which was missing and uh, replacing something for them so that they can uh, operate and they can succeed in the mainstream system. It's moving to quality support for all learners. How can we organise learning more flexibly? How can we adapt learning towards learners' natural uh, approaches to learning more effectively? Um, inclusive practice is increasingly being seen by policymakers and practitioners across Europe as a mega strategy, an approach for raising achievements of all learners, not just the few who might have the most complex needs. The agency has a shared position on inclusive education, um, and this is that our member countries have agreed that the vision for inclusive education is all learners at any age are provided with meaningful, high quality educational opportunities in their local community alongside their friends and peers. This is a vision. This is something all countries are working towards. No European country has achieved this fully. There are lots of examples of good practice. There are some examples of not so good practice. But this is a vision. It's a vision held by the member countries of the agency, as well as by the European Commission and international organisations such as UNESCO and the United Nation. What I would say is this vision and this small statement took two years of negotiation to agree upon with our member countries. Two years of arguing over words and terms and the explanations that go behind that. There are a number of key concepts that we had to clarify with our member countries before we could agree that shared vision. Um, one of them was that we have to think about and we have to understand that high-performing education systems combine quality and equity. And that's not a statement from the European Agency, that's backed up with a lot of research from the United Nations, from OECD, from the European Commission, from national level researchers. Inclusive practice is about equal opportunities, but it's about equitable outcomes. All learners have possibilities and the support to give them possibilities to achieve what they are capable of achieving. Um, this February was actually a little bit of a landmark in policy terms within the European circles. Um, the European Union and uh, the, with the involvement of the EFTA states, uh, Switzerland, Iceland, Norway and Liechtenstein, they have what's called a Council of Ministers. And the Council of Ministers operates in different areas, different uh, spheres and social spheres, education being one of them. In February, under the Maltese presidency of the European Council for Education, a new set of council conclusions was agreed. And this was on high quality education for all. And in that council conclusions, it actually states that inclusive education is the approach for, uh, for improving high quality education for all across all member states. This set of council conclusions is likely to become quite a guiding document for policymakers' work in the future because it's really pushing them to think about the change in thinking of inclusive education. It's really challenging them to think about inclusion as being for all learners and learners from a range of different backgrounds and not just a few children we might identify as having special educational needs. So, the final section of my, uh, of my input, and I think we're good for time, um, 
An easy example. I was explaining to our colleagues here earlier, easy. I'm going to make a joke. Uh, easy is European Agency Statistics for Inclusive Education. If ever there was an area of work I've been involved in that was not easy, this is it. So, um, yes. And the reason why this is not easy is the words. It's the language. It's the shared understandings. Why are we doing this, though? Um, if we don't have data that can help us change our thinking, that can challenge us in our thinking, that can make us think in slightly different ways, that's a bit problematic. It's problematic for policymakers and it's problematic for practitioners as well. Um, this is a statement from one of our, our documents. I think it's really powerful. Children don't count if they're not counted. If some, in some countries, uh, collecting data on children and young people and people with different forms of additional needs is actually a bit problematic. People don't want to identify particular learners in particular ways and then just count them in a very black and white way. Um, but if we don't have data on these populations, it's very difficult to think about changes, to think about trends, and to have evidence for how some of the things we're doing might be having effects. So the European Agency Easy Work has developed over a period of quite a number of years. Um, 15 years ago is when our member countries first asked the European Agency to start collecting statistical data that the policymakers we work with could use in different ways to inform their work. And originally, we were using terminology and concepts like special educational needs. We were collecting data on how many children were identified within the country's legislation as having a special educational need. This then developed into thinking about special needs education and the wider system. And then the data collection we're trying to implement now is about inclusive education. The biggest element and challenge of this work has not been collecting numbers. It's not been getting the numbers from the countries. All of the countries can provide us with lots and lots of numbers. It's been getting the right numbers based on the shared understandings. It's been agreeing with different groups of people. Who are we talking about? What are we talking about? And what numbers accurately represent those agreements? So we needed an operational definition of what do we mean by inclusion? What's an inclusive setting? And we worked quite extensively with our policymakers on this issue. And we agreed that for our data collection work and also for some other areas of our, our project work, that we would use an operational definition of learners being in a mainstream classroom with their mainstream peers for at least 80% or more time of the school week. And this was considered by the majority of the countries as being a reasonable operational definition of an inclusive placement. Anything more than 80% of time is actually more than one day a week away from your peers in a classroom. And so that was seen as being, well, is that really inclusive inclusion if a child's spending a lot of time outside of the mainstream classroom? Very few countries can provide actual data on this, actually including Norway. You're, you're not able to give us data exactly on how much time children are spending in classrooms. But most countries can provide proxy indicators. They've got some other way of, of estimating this. Another area of agreement we had to reach was what might be an operational definition of special educational needs? 
And the starting point was, uh, for this was looking at all countries' legal systems for special educational needs, and then looking at what the legal definitions of the different countries included and trying to find out, well, are there similarities? Are there areas of congruence where all countries seem to say there are some children who can be identified and have their needs identified in a very similar way? And um, this is the operational definition we've been using to collect data on a very small number of children, a very um, particular population of children with special educational needs. This has been our starting point. We're hoping to develop it and expand that. But this work has taken almost three years to, to reach fruition because to reach these sorts of agreements with the countries really has been a, a, a challenge, let's put it that way. So the current easy work, what we're focusing on is, is equity issues. Um, what data is available that tells us about access to education for all learners, access to inclusive education, gender issues and age appropriate issues. And if anybody would be interested in the full data sets, then I can give you the web link and uh, you can see all of the data that I'm going to show you now from all of the countries that have participated. Um, I couldn't do a presentation uh, about data without giving you some numbers, some easy numbers, I hope. Uh, access to, to education, access to mainstream education. When we look at 28 countries' data, we can see that across all of the 28 countries, 97.36% of the school population of children at ISCED levels one and two are in mainstream education. It's quite a good rate. For Norway, you're 99.63%. So if the, we don't have Eurovision song contests of inclusion, we, we, we don't go in for that. But in this respect, it's showing us that Norway is very much on the mainstream inclusion side of placement of children who've got identified needs. Access to inclusive education is where are those children spending the majority of their time? So they might be enrolled in a mainstream school, but um, where are they spending their time? Are they in a, a, an inclusive setting using the, the, the benchmark of 80% that I presented earlier or not? Here we can see that there's a, a bit of a, a drop across countries from 27 countries' data. It goes down to just under 97%. And with Norway as well, there's just a small drop. You've got uh, some um, recognised special education separate settings. Here's where things get a little bit interesting for Norway. Um, when we look at the data for how many children are identified as having special educational needs, we've got data for 30 countries there. If we look across that data, we can see that the average is 4.53%. There are some countries with a lot less. There are a few countries with a lot more. And Norway is at the end of the lot more countries range. You identify a huge number of children as having special educational needs, the highest levels of special educational needs. Now, I'm saying nothing about that in terms of what that might mean. I'm just presenting you as a fact that maybe it's something for you to be thinking about. Why is Norway identifying so many children as having special needs? Um, in terms of gender... Across Europe, all countries, we can see a two-to-one ratio. Two boys for every one girl is identified as having special educational needs. Same in Norway. Two boys for every one girl. I'm not saying anything about that apart from, is this a question to be thinking, why? Are, are special needs so more prevalent in boys? Well, the research is actually saying no. 
Um, there are a few more conditions which may be uh, a link to special educational needs for boys more than girls, but not equating for an extra 100% of the population. What does that say about how we set up and think about special needs education? Um, I think I'll skip the last one and, uh, yes, I'll show you this one. Uh, the percentage of children who've got a recognised special educational needs in inclusive settings. Around about 4% across Europe of children are in inclusive settings with a, a recognised decision for SEN. In Norway, you've got 7%, almost double the amount. Not saying anything is just a question and posing it to you as something which maybe could inform your thinking about what's happening in our system and how do we understand our system and how do we understand concepts such as special educational needs and inclusive education in our system. Um, my final slide. I think I'm out of time. Oh, yes, the screen's gone black. I'm out of time. I'll talk quick. Um, the final points I'd leave you with. Very often we can be talking about the same, we can be talking the same language. But more often than not, my experience of working in European contexts is not just between countries, but also within countries. We might not always be talking about the same things. Um, and they're, they're very often looking and examining at how other people think about the terms that we think we understand in a particular way. It can help us in developing and thinking about our own work. And in particular, I think looking at the data, which might be very focused, might be very limited, it doesn't tell us anything about practice, it's just telling us a few facts. If nothing else, it can help us think about, well, where are we and where do we want to be? And let's have a discussion about how we might want to get there. Okay, on that, if you'd like more information about anything I've presented or about the agency in general, it'd be a pleasure to get in touch with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>